Amen. Today is the fifth Sunday of this blessed month. And anytime that we have a fifth Sunday, we have a special reading because we're, the church considers a fifth Sunday of the month to be uh, an additional uh, a blessing. So we always read from um, this amazing miracle. And so, you know, it's interesting with this miracle, um, we're actually going to read it for the second Sunday of the blessed month of Amshir, which is in a couple of weeks from now. Um, but there are many ways that our Lord could have uh, executed and performed this miracle. He could have prayed and he could have waved his hands over the crowd and, you know, poof, whatever, whatever food that particular person wanted, um, it would have been right in front of them. Uh, but he wanted everyone to eat from these common loaves that were given as a gift. He could have handled that part very differently, too. He could have prayed over the basket, you know, waved his hands over it. And just like in a movie with special effects, you would have seen the basket start to move and to jiggle. And then suddenly these loaves would have started to, to multiply and it would have poured out of the basket. It would have gone from five loaves to 500 loaves, so to speak. <clears throat> and there would have just been bread all over the place. More than enough for everyone to eat. It's interesting that the Gospel of St. John, that these 12 basket fulls of fragments were gathered up after all of the thousands of people have eaten. And it doesn't say that these are fragments of thousands of loaves. It doesn't say it's fragments of hundreds of loaves. It says... They gathered them together and filled the 12 baskets with the fragments of the five loaves. Do we realize what this means? It means that our Lord Jesus Christ took the gift of the five loaves and the two fish. He blessed it. He prayed over it. And then when he handed it back to his disciples, it was still five loaves. It didn't look any different. It didn't have any change. There weren't even six loaves. The loaves didn't get bigger. It was the same five loaves. And then he and his disciples start to break the loaves into pieces. And he breaks the loaves in and passes them out. <clears throat> and they just keep breaking and breaking and breaking. And well, there are just still five loaves there. You break off pieces and now it's not a whole loaf but you never run out. You keep breaking off the piece and you feed all of these people, these thousands of people. And it seems to be at the very heart of God's creation in this principle. Blessings and the multiplication of blessings only come after we're broken. You think about that from the very beginning of creation. Even before sin enters the world, when God started the family, when he started it all with, with one man named Adam. And he does something different in creation that he does with man than any other creation. When God speaks with animals, for example, when he speaks deer, there are two deer, male, female, right? When he speaks bear, they come into being, male and female. Fish, birds, male and female. But God does not do this with man. God takes the dust of the earth and with his own hands, he forms the very first man. And then God himself breathes life into Adam, the Holy Spirit. And unlike the rest of creation, God does not create female separately. In other words, he doesn't get more dust and create Eve, another human being. He doesn't name her woman after that, after creating her out of dust. No, Adam, even before sin has entered the world and entered paradise, has, before sin has entered the Garden of, of Eden, Adam had to be broken. Um, God put Adam into a deep sleep. We know this. <clears throat> he took a chunk out of his side, blood and bone and, and flesh. And while Adam was still asleep, God closes and seals him up, and God takes Adam's brokenness after this first divine surgery, and these pieces <clears throat> that he has broken out of Adam, and he forms Eve, the mother of all the living. 
And if God had not done that, there would have still been one person on earth. For man to be fruitful and to multiply and to cover the whole earth and for heaven to be populated with human beings, Adam had to be broken. Out of that brokenness came marriage. Out of that brokenness came family. Out of that brokenness came society. Okay, we fast forward to Noah. I want to give you another example. Fast forward to Noah. The entire world has fallen into sin. <clears throat> Almost everybody had forgotten God, and they turned their back to God. And we know the rest of the story. One man is faithful. One man finds grace in the eyes of the Lord. And God not only saves him, but God saves him and his entire family through what St. Peter calls the baptism. The flood was a baptism. And we see this glorious salvation through the waters, through the ark. But let us not also forget the brokenness that Noah had to endure and suffer for hundreds of years before the first drop of water. It says in scripture that he was a preacher of righteousness, that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. He was a preacher of righteousness and he told people, look, here's God. Here's how you follow him. This is what godliness looks like. And scripture records that fact that only the only ones who ended up hearing and, and being saved after centuries, after hundreds of years of preaching, were just members of his own family. Can you imagine preaching for hundreds of years and the only people that will listen to you is your family members, your wife and your kids? Wouldn't you think about that after a couple of hundred of years go by, you would get a little bit discouraged? I believe Noah was broken. Broken by the hardness of heart and the refusal to listen to the message. I believe his heart was broken by the hundreds of years that went into the preparation and the building of the ark. And when he's warning the people, judgment is coming and judgment is coming. Be careful. The waters are going to fall out of the sky. And you see that the waters of the baptism not only saved Noah, <clears throat> those same waters also condemned the unbelievers. But before Noah and his family could experience salvation, they had to experience countless years of rejection and brokenness. Think of the Israelites that had to be broken before entering the promised land. Think of the sinful woman in the New Testament. Not long, I'll give you a quick reminder. Not long before our Lord met his death on the cross, a woman who had sinned much had been forgiven much and therefore loved much. She took an alabaster flask full of very precious and expensive ointment, a year's wages, some of the commentators say. Imagine how much your, your household earns an entire year. She took this jar and in one swoop breaks it so that she can spend her entire life savings, her entire future, to anoint Christ for his upcoming burial because she loves him. Our Lord said that this was such a good act that she would be remembered forever. But for that to happen, the jar had to be broken. Something had to be broken. And so we reflect on ourselves. Sometimes we look back on our own lives and we shake our heads and we think of two or three things that could have gone just a little bit differently. And our lives would have been so much more different. This relationship would be different or, or better even. We'd have so much money. My health would be so much more better off if I had just done some things differently. This is not the right way to look at it. We have to ask ourselves some, some important questions. Do we want to be a blessing from God to other people? Do we want to be a blessing to our own families? Do we want to be a blessing to the world? Do you want God to multiply his blessings out into the entire world through you? If so, then just like the loaves and the fish, we have to be broken. We have to be broken. This is an uncomfortable teaching in the Orthodox Church. You see, the difficult and most challenging things that come to us in our lives 
are not curses from God. If we receive them humbly, if we learn from them, if they teach us to be humble and to lean on Christ, then these horrible situations that hurt us so badly are actually blessings. They are the very means by which God brings us to our knees and bring us to brokenness, to empty ourselves when we have been so full of ourselves. I'm speaking for myself, not speaking for anyone here. When we have been so full of ourselves to empty us so that finally when we are emptied, he can fill us with himself. He can fill us with his spirit. Once you are no longer full of yourself, but you are full of him, now God can do something with you. <clears throat> Our Lord continues to break the bread even today. Every time we come to his table, every time we come to partake of his body and his blood, our salvation itself is a blessing that could have never been multiplied across the world if our Lord, unless our Lord Jesus Christ himself in the flesh had been not broken in Golgotha. It would have never happened. Every year as we, get, we approach Great Lent, <clears throat> we reflect on the stations of the cross. In fact, most of the Sunday school classrooms would at this time be preparing to make the stations of the cross in their own classrooms and then the adults would go in and go through Reliving the journey that Christ went through is an intense, uh, through intense humiliation and shame and suffering and death and burial for us. This is what we would be reflecting on as we're approaching Great Lent. He was broken just like the bread that he broke and when he multiplied the loaves and the fish. And just as he gave those loaves and those fish for the life of those thousands of people, so he breaks his body, and for us, for the very life of the world. Our Lord said, My flesh is food indeed, my blood is drink indeed. He goes on to say, If you do not eat the flesh and drink of the blood of the Son of Man, you will have no life within you. But he said, If you do eat my flesh, and you do drink my blood, then I will raise you up on the last day. An amazing promise. An amazing blessing. Every time the priest comes to pray the liturgy and we turn through God, the Holy Spirit, the bread and the wine, changing it to the very body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, every time that happens, the priest breaks that bread. The priest takes a little piece of that bread that was a whole piece, which is now broken, and just like the body of Christ that was broken on the cross. And it's only a broken Eucharist that is the body and the blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, which is the life of the world. The Eucharist itself is impossible unless you have bread and wine. And having bread and wine is impossible unless you have wheat and grapes. But before you can get that loaf of bread, every kernel of wheat has to be crushed into flour so that it can be bound together into one loaf. Every grape has to go through its own personal Golgotha to be crushed and shed its blood, so to speak, so that now we can have wine for the Eucharist. Everything in creation centers around this point of humility and self-sacrifice and brokenness. Everything in, in creation. So that through your brokenness, life and blessings come to your spouse, come to your kids, come to your parents, your neighbors, your co-workers, and the whole world. Christ would not bless you with eternal life without himself being broken. You cannot receive that gift of eternal life without humbling yourself profoundly. And unless you yourself are broken, you cannot be a blessing to your family and to the world unless you are willing to be broken. It is a death, it is an experience of suffering, but it doesn't end there. For you see, the, the promise, the, the, the positive side of this is, these broken fragments of bread are not left for the bugs. They're not left for the birds, they're not led to rot. 
If you notice in the scripture that we read today, therefore they gathered them together and filled 12 baskets with the fragments of the five loaves, which remained over and above unto them that had it been eaten. Why do they do this? Because Christ himself gave the command, gather up the fragments that remain and nothing be lost. Not one. He did not save a single whole loaf of bread. Notice, it was only the ones that were broken, only the fragments. But every fragment was picked up. Every single fragment was picked up. Every piece of bread that had been broken was picked up so that nothing would be lost. Do you want to be gathered up by Christ and his apostles? It's an amazing reflection. If you want to be gathered up, then you have to be a fragment. You have to be a fragment. If you want to be saved, then you have to be one of those pieces of bread that was broken. So to conclude, regardless of whatever difficulties that we may face, regardless of our own shortcomings, one thing is certain. When we obey our Lord Jesus Christ, he will allow us to see miracles in our life. It's a very clear promise. He alone has the power to give us good things, things that we truly desire in our hearts and that we need in our hearts. He alone can multiply grace and spiritual blessings and the peace and joy that come with them. And what's asked from return? Where's the negotiation here? Christ promises us res resurrection. He promises glory. He promises us to even sit with him on his very throne in heaven. But to get there, you have to go through the same path that he did. Before the resurrection comes the cross. Before glory comes humility. Before exaltation comes on your knees broken. No one who comes to Christ hungry or thirsty is ever turned away empty-handed. Ever. The Lord provides because he loves his children. There is no good father who doesn't offer the very best that he has to his kids. Only bring your small offering and obey his voice. Sit at his feet and be patient. As, a, as David the psalmist writes, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. Be patient. May our Lord Jesus Christ also hear our cry and multiply whatever we may have to the glory of his name. And glory be to God forever. Amen. Amen.